Dear colleagues, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this beautiful Congress. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to tell you about uh, thyroid embolization. Uh, as the previous speakers uh, has already mentioned, uh, heat-based ablations are standard minimally invasive procedure in solid thyroid nodules. <clears throat> In practice, however, there are a number of nodule types that are not very favorable for heat-based ablations, uh, such as large nodules, especially uh, with uh, more than 30 milliliters volume. Uh, the, in such uh, uh, nodules, the volume reduction with RFA is generally not sufficient. Or multiple nodules, uh, namely a multinodular goiter that requires uh, too many punctures and induce more trauma to the thyroid, and also hypervascular nodules because of the increased risk of bleeding with ablation and also the uh, heat sink effect. And, uh, uh, and finally, substernal nodules uh, because of the difficulty to see with uh, ultrasound. In such nodules, uh, we have been uh, using uh, thyroid embolization uh, for the last uh, nine years. And uh, in 1921, we published an article on thyroid artery embolization in uh, JVIR. And after the publication of this article, uh, American Thyroid Association um, um, published a statement. Uh, and for the first time, they mentioned thyroid artery embolization as a potential treatment for large symptomatic multiple nodular goiters, uh, especially if surgery is contraindicated or refused. The technique of thyroid embolization is similar to other embolizations. We typically use local anesthesia and conscious sedation. We prefer common femoral access. And uh, we, after we uh, insert fi a five French sheet, uh, we inject 5,000 units of heparin for anticoagulation. Uh, after sheet pl placements, uh, we advance a uh, diagnostic catheter uh, and uh, catheterize all the uh, thyroid arteries uh, selectively. And uh, bef uh, before the embolization, we advance a coaxial microcatheter uh, over a, a 0014-inch uh, guide wire. For embolization, we prefer PBA particles uh, between 2,050 to 500 uh, microns, and we typically add some papaverin to uh, avoid spasm. And depending on the nodule size and number, we uh, embolize two arteries, three arteries, or sometimes uh, four arteries. Uh, this is an example, a 48-year-old lady with a large multinodular goiter. This is before the procedure, as you can see. Uh, she has large lumps in, in her neck. And uh, this is the uh, procedure. This is the right uh, superior thyroidal artery and right inferior thyroidal artery. And uh, this is during the embolization. And after embolization, you see the stagnation. And um, as you can see, the left superior thyroidal artery is not feeding the large nodules. So it is practically normal, but the inferior thyroidal artery left does. So we embolize this artery also. And this is the picture of the lady at six months. Uh, and she uh, has almost a uh, normal looking neck. Uh, after the procedure, and she is very happy with the outcome. Uh, in our publication, we have seen that uh, after thyroid artery embolization, the thyroid volume, the dominant nodule volume, intrathoracic extension, and quality of life scores have improved significantly at six months. And uh, I would like to uh, show you some examples from our series. This is a 41 year old patient who has compressive symptoms and uh, cosmetic concerns. And this is before the embolization. He had a large goiter 
and this is a CT image of the goiter, the embolization, and one year later, you can see a marked difference uh, between before and after images. Uh, this is the uh, coronal MRI image of a 55-year-old male who underwent uh, embolization for a large plunging goiter. Uh, this is before uh, the procedure. As you can see, it is difficult to say that this organ is actually a thyroid. But at six months, it looks like a, a relatively enlarged thyroid. And at 40 months, uh, the, the thyroid looks uh, close to normal. And the thyroid hormones are still in the normal range at 40 months. Uh, this is the same patient, sagittal MRI view. You see the clavicle level. And this is the plunging part of the goiter. And at six months, you see that that part is uh, has shrunk significantly. And at 40 months, it is uh, even smaller. And most importantly, thyroid hormones are still normal in this patient. Uh, this patient had a large nodule, benign nodule, very hypervascular. And we embolized two arteries only. And this is before the procedure, and this is six months after the procedure. And I would like to give you some tips and tricks for new beginners. Uh, it is very important that uh, we select the suitable patient first. Uh, we must begin with the easiest case. And the, in my opinion, the ideal case is a large vascular nodule in a young patient. Because young patient means very straight and easy to catheterize uh, arteries. And a large vascular nodule means that uh, the, the nodule has large feeders, which is easy to uh, catheterize. Uh, you must avoid patients over 60, especially those with hypertension, because the, uh, in such patients, the arteries are very tortuous, and you must avoid Graves' disease in the beginning, because it is difficult to manage these patients preoperatively and uh, postoperatively. Uh, patient uh, preparation is very important. Uh, you must remember that uh, uh, pretreatment with antithyroid medication is indicated in almost all patients. We typically use tyromazole or similar uh, for at least, we restart them for at least two weeks before the procedure if the patient is a thyroid. And uh, if the patient has Graves' disease, we continue to use this medication until thyroid uh, TSH is normal. So in either case, you must avoid embolization when TSH is low. Uh, attention is required to some technical details. Uh, we must admit that thromboembolism is a big risk in thyroid artery embolization. So anticoagulation is indicated. We typically use a 5,000 units heparin, intravenous or intraarterial, after sheet placement. And we add more if the procedure is prolonged. We uh, always flush the dead space of the catheter uh, only below aortic arc. So we throw the, we, we throw the catheter below the aortic arcus and then uh, flush the catheter. Or you may prefer to flush it continuously with heparinized saline as in neurointerventions. This is also possible. Uh, avoidance of proximal embolization and reflux is very important. Uh, to avoid this, we add vasodilator like papaverin to the particle solution. And we typically use dilute PVA. This is our preference, but you may prefer to use hydrophilic particles instead. Uh, and uh, we, you must prefer soft and thin microcatheters to and also minimize wire manipulations uh, in the tiny thyroid arteries to avoid spasm. And most importantly, you need to take your time and inject very, very slowly until stagnation occurs. And uh, in the remaining a few minutes, I would like to uh, talk uh, briefly on cryoablation because I think it is, it is very important uh, to have this uh, uh, weapon in our arsenal. Uh, why? Because there are uh, some nodules that are unfavorable for radiofrequency and embolization also. These are toxic nodules. We know that toxic nodules are more resistant to RFA and uh, RFA is not uh, successful in roughly half of the cases. Malignant nodules are uh, difficult to treat with RFA, although except for the very small ones, and indeterminate nodules are not recommended to, to be treated with RFA. So in such cases, obviously, 
uh, a stronger or more complete ablation is required. And I believe cryoablation may be the answer in such cases uh, because cryoablation uses freezing and it causes much less pain. So this is more comfortable for the patient and the patient is more cooperative during the procedure. Ablation area is clearly visible on ultrasound. So this may provide a more controlled ablation and better protection of the adjacent organs. And we know also that uh, freezing or ice is less harmful to collagenous tissue uh, compared to RFA and macrovae. So in practice, no significant damage occurs to trachea, vessel wall, and strap muscles during the procedure. I would like to show you some uh, examples. Uh, this, uh, this patient had a 12 millimeter papillary cancer. You see the ice ball during the cryoablation. And interestingly, after the ice ball is melted, you're still seeing the cryoablated area as a relatively gray area than the normal thyroid parenchyma. So I think this is very important uh, because at the end of the procedure, you can make sure that the, the nodule or the cancer is uh, included completely in the ablation area. Uh, this is another patient, 50-year-old uh, female with uh, 13 millimeter uh, irregular bordered uh, papillary cancer. And this is during the procedure, you see the ice ball. And at uh, 10 months later, uh, you can see that the thyroid looks almost normal. So you can see no nodules, no cancer in this area. So I think this is, this is very important and very, very uh, encouraging uh, in such cases. Uh, this is uh, a patient that we have learned a lot. This was a 15-year-old uh, patient uh, who was a singer. And uh, her mother was very, very reluctant to, uh, uh, to, for he, her to undergo surgery. And uh, unfortunately, she had a very large papillary cancer, like uh, five centimeter in size. And um, uh, we have decided to help this patient. And we invited her uh, to our clinic. And uh, during the uh, uh, treatment, uh, I have uh, ablated nine times the uh, uh, so I have used nine overlapping ablations to cover the whole nodule and at six months you can see that uh, the volume uh, dropped from 27 milliliters to 2.4 milliliters so more than 90 percent decrease in, in in volume and at 30 months it was uh, even smaller uh, so may, maybe uh, uh, roughly 95% uh, uh, volume reduction has occurred. So you see the nodule in the transverse image, uh, the cancer, and uh, you see the appearance at 30 months uh, again. So there is a marked uh, difference and there was no lymph node metastasis in this patient. Uh, so we, it's, it's been now uh, four years since we treated with this patient and uh, she's still uh, disease-free. Uh, so in conclusion, most benign thyroid nodules are suitable for radiofrequency ablation or similar heat-based ablations. But uh, for nodules, that is not very favorable for radiofrequencies such as multinodular goiter, large nodules, toxic nodules, or indeterminate nodules, and most importantly, papillary cancers. Please remember that interventional radiology has two more weapons. These are embolization and cryoablation. Thank you very much for your attention.